When I say King's Quest, which entry in the series comes to mind? For some people, that answer would be King's Quest 6, and for others, it could be the 2015 reboot. And for some of you watching, it probably means nothing at all. And you maybe know that there's a bloke with a funny hat in it who dies a lot. But for a lot of people at least somewhat familiar with the series, I'd wager that when they think King's Quest, they think King's Quest 5, Absence Makes the Heart Go Yonder. I don't think it's too much of a controversial statement to say that King's Quest V is probably one of the most iconic quest games in Sierra's library. I mean, even if you haven't played a single second of it, you might have seen a review or let's play of it. So chances are, someone out there has already told you about King's Quest V. However, the question I really want to ask today is how does the game actually fare in terms of structure and design? And really, is it still a game that's worth playing? Let's find out. Released in 1990, King's Quest V was a huge leap forward for Sierra. It marked a leap in graphical quality and it even had a full voice cast as part of the CD release. And for the time, this was big stuff. You see, LucasArts wouldn't have voice acting in their games until around 1993. Of course, as a side product of its iconic status, King's Quest V is probably the most widely reviewed and riffed on King's Quest, if only to laugh at the silly, annoying owl and the multitude of ridiculous deaths. But I think there's more to talk about than just that with this game, which is why I wanted to cover it. Not that there's no value in poking fun though, I mean, everyone enjoys a bit of ribbing and this game deserves at least a pinch of that. King's Quest V begins with the sinister robed wizard appearing and nicking an entire castle. <laughs> just the whole thing. I don't think I've ever seen a damseled castle before, but hey, points for originality. To be fair, this is a castle containing the family of this guy here, King Graham of Daventry. As it happens, he wasn't in the castle when it was taken. He was just going for a leisurely saunter through the woods. And of course, the blissfully unaware King's day is ruined when he realizes that his entire castle's missing. My castle? What has happened? Luckily, there was a witness. Enter Cedric the Owl, a source for much riffing in King's Quest V, and perhaps one of the main reasons why this game has such a reputation. <laughs> but that doesn't mean he can't be a tad irritating, although I think that's the point and also part of the reason why he's well known, actually. In my opinion, Richard Aronson, who plays the beloved owl, puts in a pretty good performance in regards to what a talking owl might sound like. So basically what I'm saying is prepare yourself for a lot of ooh sounds. Friendly reminder that Cedric is a constant companion throughout the game. And if I'm being completely honest, I enjoy Cedric more than a lot of people seem to. He's endearing and he fits into the whimsical feel of the King's Quest franchise. Although perhaps for some people, he does go off the deep end of whimsy, I don't know. Cedric explains that King Graham's castle was taken by Mordak, an evil wizard. But Cedric doesn't think that Graham can take on the evil sorcerer by himself. Well. It is my opinion that you don't stand a chance against the likes of Mordak. That's a bit rude, Cedric. In order to help the rescue mission, Cedric brings Graham to Crispin Arthur, who is, believe it or not, his employer. Which means, actually, Cedric gets paid, and considering the adventure we're about to go on, he's not getting paid enough. Graham, help me! Anyway, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, Graham has some magic dust sprinkled on him, which allows him to fly to the land of Serenia. And Graham almost dies, much to the apathy of Cedric. But I mean, hey, as long as he gets paid, right? Crispin comes out, brings Graham out of the stream and into the house, and they have some tea. Made by Cedric, apparently. Cedric, go into the house and pour each of us a nice hot cup of tea. Ooh, I right, Crispin. Not sure how an owl can make tea, but hey. <laughs> Nature's full of wonders, isn't it? The good wizard gives some exposition on the bad wizard, and also explains that his own magic isn't as powerful these days. I used to be a very powerful wizard at one time, you know, but I've gotten a little rusty lately. <laughs> a little rusty? That's quite enough from you, Cedric. And so, Crispin hands you a non-functioning magic wand, pats you on the back and sends you on your merry way. Oh yeah, and we get to keep Cedric too. We're dead. No, Graham, don't! Regardless, we're now left to explore the land of Serenia, which includes a desert, several sad people in need of stuff and things, a little town, an inn, and much more. I'd say it's the most substantial segment of the game, and that most of these areas are actually dependent on each other. As in, an item you get from one place is useful in another. It's a big cross-stitch of inventory puzzles. 
I do have an interesting fact about Serenia though. This isn't the first time it's been in a Sierra game. As a matter of fact, it first appeared in 1980's The Wizard and the Princess, a game for the Apple II, which was one of the earliest graphic adventure games. It was also later repackaged in 1982 as Adventure in Serenia. What this means is technically, The Wizard and the Princess is a King's Quest game. It's sort of a prequel. And here, in Serenia once again, you can find this skeleton. But who does this skeleton belong to? According to the second edition of the King's Quest Companion Guide, this guy was the protagonist of The Wizard and the Princess, known only as The Wanderer. They call him The Wanderer, but no longer does he roam around, 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 around. We also take his old boot for later. It'll be relevant later, trust me. Back to King's Quest V, one thing we can also find in this area is the classic poisonous snake. I mean, it's probably only an iconic moment because of Cedric, but nonetheless, everyone who knows about this game knows about the snake. Graham, watch out! A poisonous snake! In the past, some people have brought up the fact that Cedric is wrong here, because snakes are venomous, not poisonous. And the game actually does know this, because the narrator says so. A large, venomous snake blocks Graham's passage to the east. Which means the only person who doesn't know is Cedric. You know what, take it all back, he doesn't deserve that paycheck. And one other thing you might not know about this snake is that it has a voice too. It's pretty easy to miss, since as far as I'm aware it only has one line. But if you use the pickup icon on the snake, he actually speaks to you. Stay away. This is my path. You know, that's something that I missed on a lot of other playthroughs, both on mine and other people's. I tell you what, I love finding new things in adventure games. We can also speak to Cedric here, and he explains that the snake is guarding the path onwards. So that's the way to go when we want to leave Serenia. But not before getting a few things out of the way first. You're gonna need a cloak, some rope, a hammer, a sled, a harp, a leg of lamb, and a custard pie. I mean, that sounds like quite the shopping list, right? But like I mentioned before, it's a cross-stitch of inventory puzzles. And as such, Serenia has quite a bit to do. And a lot of the mini quests are interwoven. Certain deeds that you do will give you items that you can trade in at the town for other necessary tools for your adventure. For instance, the witch in the forest allows you to save the princess and return a spinner to a gnome, which will get you both the harp and the marionette. The marionette can then be traded in at the toy shop for a sled. But in order to do all of that, you first need to get rid of the witch. And in the words of Uncle from Jackie Chan Adventures, Magic must defeat magic. Does anyone else remember that show? I mean, it was awesome. Maybe I should talk about it someday. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm getting distracted here. I'll get back to it. So make your way to a local desert temple. And in there, there's a genie lamp. But you can't get into the temple until you steal a staff from a bandit camp. If it sounds complex, trust me, it's not that bad. In my opinion, weaving puzzles together in this way means that it's not as easy to miss a specific item when you leave Serenia. I, I actually think this is pretty well done here. I mean, of course, it's still possible to screw up, but if the game hadn't been structured in this way, I think this problem would have been a lot worse. The first area here is very reminiscent of what the first four King's Quest games were. Quite often, even though there are some exceptions, you were dropped into a large open area in which you needed to solve a bunch of interwoven puzzles. The games are very much still linear, but there's an element of freedom because of all the interesting places you can explore, and there's something important to do and find in every area. Anyway, I suppose one little issue in this area of the game is the inn. Not sure what poor Graham ever did to these guys, but they will kill you if you try to enter. Rub em out. And you do need to be there in order to get the leg of lamb. Seems like a bit too much ever for a bit of meat, really. In order to not die in some thug's basement, you need the Wanderer's old boot from the desert. You see? I told you it'd be relevant. Which is used to stop a cat from catching a rat. <coughs> now bear with me for a second. You see, the rat will repay its debt and chew through the ropes while you're in the basement, allowing you to escape provided you have a hammer. It might be considered a little bit harsh that you only get one chance at saving the rat, but I feel like it's a significant enough event that most players will understand that not saving the rat will spell disaster for them in the long term. It's not great design, but it's kind of obvious and signposted, so it sort of works. Anyway, once you think you've done everything in Serenia, you're able to move past the beloved poisonous snake using the tambourine. Be gone, SUCK! From this point onwards, King's Quest V is more linear, which I think works. Adding in a whole new area might have been a little bit overwhelming after you only just finished Serenia. Instead, we get a simple straightforward snowy area that prompts you to possibly think about if you've gone there without everything you need. If you forget the cloak, the lamb or the sled, you'll die pretty early on. Now that might seem harsh, but I think it's early enough in the area that it's fair. 
There are a couple of items used later which are less fairly applied, but I'll talk about them in a bit. But in other news, this segment introduces Graham's blood-curdling scream. <laughs> That must have given a few kids nightmares, let's be honest here. Past this point, Cedric is captured, you go on a sled ride, give an eagle some meat, and see a large icy palace guarded by a couple of wolves. In this palace, you meet Isabella, who doesn't like you, unless you play music. I'm not fully sure how to explain it, you just play the harp and she's totally fine with you. If only it was always that easy to escape a hostage situation. She spares you mostly on the condition that you'll help her out. And what you need to do is remove a yeti. Now unfortunately, Graham isn't quite Saxon Hale, despite being a beefcake. So you can't just use brute force here. Oh no, the required skill to take down this hulking beast is bakery. Yeah, the custard pie. This is probably one of the worst offenders in terms of puzzle design, really. The other ones can be justified by forcing you to use them early in the snowy area, but the pie? Not only is it incredibly unconventional as a solution to the Yeti problem, it's an item that's actually easy to miss, and it isn't really interwoven with any of the other puzzles. The reason for this is that you buy the pie with a silver coin, which is found on the floor of the street. It's not necessarily that easy to spot, which makes the whole pie plus Yeti puzzle a little bit problematic. But like I said, I think this is about as bad as it gets. There's maybe one other example a lot later on, but I'll get to that in time. Now, one thing I do want to mention here is the voice of the wolf. So let's have a quick word about the voice acting. The voice acting in Kingsford 5 is, on the whole, all right. But in some areas, it definitely leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, even the squeaky voices of the animals and elves early on at least give off an air of whimsy, you know? But here, with this wolf, there is one utterly awful voice. And I must carry out her wishes. Now, no more talking. Go to the Crystal Cave. You know when you give your dog a joke voice and make them say something like, I like sausages? It's basically the same voice. I do recognize that not many games had voices at this time though, so it might have been difficult to entice professional voice actors to give it a go. I know in some later behind the scenes videos for Sierra games, actors are a little bit bemused by the idea of doing a voice for a game. It's fun and it'll, it'll all work great, but for the actor, it's very difficult. It's very schizophrenic because they ask you a question and you have five responses. It's like nothing I've ever done. So for Sierra's first fully voiced outing to have an all-star cast of, well, the developers, it just makes sense. At least that's how I see it. I might be wrong. On another note, let's discuss the art of the game because quite frankly, it's still an amazing looking game. And I mean that sincerely. Sure, some of the characters look a little bit sunburned at times, but the beauty is really in the backdrops. The painted backgrounds are fantastic in a number of areas. I mean, look at this snowy path of the islands later in the game. There's just plenty of breathtaking sights to take in. Anyway, the path to Mordok's castle from here is fraught with many dangerous beasts, such as giant baby birds. Oh, and make sure you take that sparkly thing in the nest, otherwise you can't beat the game. Just something you should know. You then have to patch up a little boat and sail to an island full of harpies who all want a piece of Graham. And oh, oh let's be honest here, who doesn't? Oh, and make sure to take that sparkly thing on the beach, otherwise you can't beat the game. Just something you should know. I've paraphrased a few things like the old man in the shack and the sea monsters and the near death of Cedric, but eventually you find your way to Mordax Island. This part of the game is by far the most atmospheric and downright unsettling area that the game has to offer. It's a place where you're not sure what you'll face upon turning the corner, but you'll feel like you're always being watched. And also, where an evil wizard stores frozen peas at room temperature, the horror! When you're in this castle, it always feels like you're somewhere that you're not supposed to be. I mean, the eye in the study is the most eerie thing in my opinion. It just casually watches you, and you even see Mordak silently climb into his bed. It's just so unnerving. Not a lot is signposted here, so it feels dangerous. I mean, there's also the blue goon who throws you in jail. You can, however, enlist the help of the nearby scullery maid, who isn't actually a scullery maid, but Princess Cosima of the Green Isles. Now, she won't trust you unless you got the sparkly thing from the rock's nest, which turns out to be a locket containing pictures of her parents. Then, she'll help you out of the jail cell by pushing out a loose brick. The cell does contain another very important item, though. A small, mouldy piece of cheese. Graham can see a small, mouldy piece of cheese just inside the mouse hole. And yeah, it's very important, trust me. 
To get the cheese, you need a small fish hook. Where was the fish hook? Well, it's the sparkly item on the Harpy Island that I mentioned. And this is the second really bad puzzle I was talking about earlier. So can you guess the use of the cheese? Because I'm willing to bet that you really can't. Nope, you don't use it to lure a mutant rodent somewhere, you use it to uh, steal the charge from Mordak's magic wand. Yeah, that isn't a joke. I don't think anyone can defend this one really. Even Josh Mandel recently tweeted that it wasn't exactly a high point in adventure game design. I mean, who are we to argue with the voice of King Graham himself? Arrest my case. Anyway, this leads to a final showdown with Mordak, where he and Graham transform into a variety of creatures and elements to do battle. It's a pretty neat conclusion, even if it is a little bit trial and error when trying to work out which animal to become. Mordak is finally defeated when he turns into a fire, and you turn into a rain cloud to extinguish him. As far as a villain defeat goes, that's pretty creative. It's more interesting than a simple finishing blow. And with that, King's Quest V is beaten. Crispin arrives in order to help restore Graham's castle and family, and we also get a little bit of a tease in regards to the plot of King's Quest VI. My lady, I am deeply in your debt, and I will make it up to you. With your permission, I'd like to travel to the land of the Green Isles to see you. Oh, I'm sure we'll talk about that one soon enough. The game ends on a really wonderful note, as the royal family of Daventry walk back to their restored castle. It's pretty sweet. Overall, King's Quest V, while not my favourite of the series, is undoubtedly one of the most King's Quest-y King's Quests. If that's a phrase that makes sense. It manages to celebrate the success of the first four games in the series, while also moving it forward with new graphics and voice acting. Even if the latter isn't that great. That is your problem. Not only that, but it begins to build up somewhat of a lore for the games. Up until this point, a lot of the creatures and situations have been borrowed from other works. But King's Quest V really starts to feel like its own thing, as opposed to being a world of familiar fairy tales. I also think that King's Quest V gets a bad rap for its puzzle design, and while it's far from perfect, I think if you save often, you can avoid pitfalls quite easily, and it's not as bad as I thought it was. I feel like a lot of the very important items are pushed in your face, so you may well notice if you've missed something. Yes, missing the fish hook on the beach or the locket in the rock's nest can push you into a dead end, but they point enough in the direction of those items that it seems reasonable to me. Maybe that's just me getting to know the game really well over time, but hey. The many deaths in this game range from hilarious and slapstick to occasionally a little irritating. But on the whole, I do think they add to the game rather than take away from it. Some of them are a little bit dumb though. The falling death can occur in some ridiculous places sometimes. No Graham, don't! Ah! And of course, there's Dear Cedric. Love him or hate him, he's a memorable aspect of the game. And I just don't think it'd be the same without him constantly hanging around and being a bit of a pest. If anything, he's the best pest. It's just that, for all its flaws, King's Quest V is just one of the most memorable in the series. The atmosphere, the design, the visuals, the voiceovers, and the characters are just built in a way that sticks. And I think that's what makes it an icon. King's Quest V Absence Makes the Heart Go Yonder is undoubtedly an imperfect game, but it really defines what a Sierra adventure is. It's brutal, it's whimsical, and honestly, it's quite fun. And with all that, thanks for watching, and remember to keep a custard pie handy. You never know when you're going to face off with a Yeti. So that's my advice for the day.